A Patriot's History of the United States, Chapter 4, Part 5. Beyond the Endless Mountains The end of the American Revolution marked the beginning of a great migration to the west across the Appalachian Mountains. The migrants followed four major routes. Pennsylvania Germans and Scotch-Irish moved south, down the Great Valley of the Appalachians, to settle in western Virginia and North Carolina. The Wilderness Road, blazed by Daniel Boone in 1775, led some of them into Kentucky and the Bluegrass region via the Cumberland Gap. One traveler described this route as the longest, blackest, hardest road in America. Carolinians traversed the mountains by horseback and wagon train until they found the Tennessee River, following its winding route to the Ohio River, then ascending the Cumberland south to the Nashville region. But the most common river route and the most popular route to the west was the Ohio. Migrants made the arduous journey over Forbes Road through the Alleghenies to Pittsburgh. There they built or bought a flatboat, purchased a copy of Zodix Kramer's River Guide, the Western Navigator, and launched their crafts and their fortune into La Belle Riviere. If the weather and navigation depth was good, and fortune smiled upon them, the trip from Pittsburgh to Louisville took seven to ten days. During the decade following the Revolution, tens of thousands of pioneers moved southwest of the Ohio River, Harrodsburg, Boonesboro, Louisville, and Lexington in Kentucky were joined by the Watauga and Nashville settlements in the northeastern and central portions of what is now the state of Tennessee. Pioneers like Daniel Boone played an irreplaceable role in cutting the trails, establishing relations with Native Americans, or defeating them if it came to a fight, and setting up early forts from which towns and commercial centers could emerge. Daniel Boone, 1734 to 1820, had traveled from Pennsylvania where his family bucked local Quakers by marrying its daughters outside the Society of Friends through Virginia, North Carolina, then finally to explore Kentucky. Crossing the famed Cumberland Gap in 1769, Boone's first expedition into the raw frontier resulted in his parties being robbed of all its fur. Boone returned a few years later to establish the settlement that bears his name. When the Revolutionary War reopened hostilities in Kentucky, Boone was captured by Shawnee Indians and remained a prisoner for months, then had to endure a humiliating court-martial for the episode. Nevertheless, few individuals did more to open the early West to British and American settlement than Daniel Boone. Daniel Boone, Civilizer, or misanthrope. As revolutionary era America began to move beyond the endless mountains into the frontiers of the Ohio and Mississippi valleys, they followed the trails blazed by Daniel Boone. Stories of Daniel Boone's exploits as a hunter, pathfinder, Indian fighter, war hero, and community builder loom large in the myth of the American West. Many of these stories are true. It is interesting to note, however, that the stories of Daniel Boone often portray him in two completely different ways, either as a wild, uncivilized frontiersman or as a leader of the vanguard aiming to tame and civilize that wild frontier. Was Daniel Boone running away from civilization or was he bringing it with him? Was he a misanthrope or a civilizer or both? Born in Pennsylvania in 1734, Daniel Boone became a hunter at 12 years of age, soon staying away from home years at a time on long hunts. He worked his way down the eastern slope of the Appalachians before plunging into the unexplored regions westward. From 1767 to 1769, he blazed the wilderness trail through the Cumberland Gap to the Kentucky Bluegrass region, where, in 1775, he established Boonesboro, an outpost for his family and friends to settle the new west. He was subsequently captured and adopted by Shawnee Indians in 1778, fought Indian and Britain alike in the Revolutionary War, and was elected sheriff in 1782 and later to the legislature of the new state of Kentucky. During this time, Boone also worked as a land company scout and land speculator. 
drawn into protracted court battles over disputed land claims, Boone went bankrupt in 1798 and then moved his large family to the uninhabited expanses west of the Mississippi River. He died near St. Charles, Missouri in 1820, having spent an eventful eight decades in the American frontier. During the course of Daniel Boone's life, stories of his exploits spread far and wide, and he became America's first frontier folk hero. Thousands claimed to know the exact spot where Boone carved on a tree, here D. Boone kilt a bear. Americans have told Boone stories for more than 200 years, and his legend has appeared in formal artistic works ranging from James Fenimore Cooper's novel, The Last of the Mohicans, 1827, and painter George Caleb Bingham's rendering, Daniel Boone, 1851 to 20th century movies and television shows, the most famous being Fess Parker's near decade-long 1960s television role as Boone. It is important to note the symbolic contrasts in the roles Daniel Boone takes on in the various famous stories about him. On the one hand, he's portrayed as a loner and a misanthrope who longs to escape society and live for years utterly alone in the wilderness. On the other hand, there is the Daniel Boone who was a husband and father, founder of Boonesboro, successful politician and real estate developer. This Daniel Boone, another biographer wrote, was an empire builder and philanthropist known for his devotion to social progress. Daniel Boone was above all else an archetypical American. He loved the wilderness and the freedom that came from frontier individualism. Like all Americans, he simultaneously believed in progress and the advance of capitalism and Republican political institutions. While he may have sometimes wished that America would always remain a sparsely inhabited wilderness, he knew that America could not and should not stand still. Sources, Theodore Roosevelt, The Winning of the West, six volumes. John Mack Frager, Daniel Boone, The Life and Legend of an American Pioneer. North of the Ohio, a slower pace of settlement took place because of strong Indian resistance. Even there, the white presence grew. Marietta, Ohio became the first permanent American settlement in the region, but was soon joined by Chillicothe, Fort Wayne, and Detroit. Census figures in 1790 showed the non-Indian population at 73,000 Kentuckians and 35,000 Tennesseans, while the Old Northwest, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, and Wisconsin boasted 5,000, with numbers rising daily. Counting the pre-1790 residents, the combined American population in all areas between the Appalachian Crest and the Mississippi River numbered an impressive 250,000. As one traveler later observed, Old America seems to be breaking up and moving westward. We are seldom out of sight as we travel on this grand track toward the Ohio of family groups behind and before us. Add to these numerous stages loaded to the utmost and the innumerable travelers on horseback, on foot, and in light wagons, and you have before you a scene of bustle and business extending over 300 miles which is truly wonderful. On the Eastern Seaboard, the Confederation Congress watched the Great Migration with interest and concern. Nearly everyone agreed that Congress would have to create a national domain, devise a method for surveying and selling public lands, formulate an Indian policy, and engage in diplomatic negotiations with the British and Spanish in the old Northwest and Southwest. Most important, Congress had to devise some form of territorial government plan to establish the rule of law in the Trans-Appalachian West. Nearly everyone agreed that these measures were necessary, but that was about all they agreed on. Western lands commanded much of Congress's attention because of the lingering problem of national domain. The Articles remained unratified because some of the landed states still refused to surrender their sea to sea claims to the central government and Maryland refused to ratify the document until they did. The logjam cleared in 1781, when Virginia finally ceded her Western claims to Congress. Maryland immediately ratified the Articles, officially making the document at long last the first Constitution 
of the United States. Although one state, Georgia, continued to claim its western lands, the remaining states chose to ignore the problem. Congress immediately set to work on territorial policy, creating a legal precedence that the nation follows to this day. Legislators saw the ramifications of their actions with remarkably clear eyes. They dealt with a huge question. If Congress, like the British Parliament before it, established colonies in the West, would they be subservient to the new American mother country or independent? Although the British model was not illogical, Congress rejected it, making the United States the first nation to allow for gradual democratization of its colonial empire. And we're going to pause here and we'll continue with this section in the next video. Thanks for watching. Please reach down, click like, subscribe to the channel, and leave a comment. I'd love to hear from you. I love you guys. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.